Well, it's wonderful to be together this morning to worship God together. Um, Lord willing, next Sunday, it's Christmas Eve Sunday, right? Uh, we'll, we'll be focusing on the birth of Christ and singing many of the traditional hymns uh, about Christ and his birth, which is uh, something we always do. But this week I thought I would do another message that had to do with the birth of Christ, but, but an important aspect of it. Uh, so once there was this Sunday school teacher who asked her class of kindergartners to draw a picture of the manger scene at the time when Jesus was born. And so the children were excited about that, and they all got to work on their little drawings of the manger scene. And the teacher began to go around the class and to look at each of the, the pictures they were drawing. She came to one of the kids' picture, and, and there was an interesting thing kind of in the corner. And so uh, she said, uh, there, there's this little portly looking gentleman in, in the corner of this picture. So she said to the little one, tell me about this person over here. And the little boy says, oh, that's round John Virgin. <laughs> now, when you think about the song Silent Night, Silent Night. Holy night, all is calm, right? Round yon virgin. Sounds a lot like John, doesn't it? Yeah. Anyhow, we can all get things a bit confused at times, can't we? So today I want to explore the question, does the virgin birth matter? Does the virgin birth birth matter. Now, I prefer to call it the virgin conception, right? Because that's the real miracle, right? It's the virgin conception. Obviously, she continued to be a virgin, and therefore, it is also a virgin birth, right? Um, the Bible reports that Mary was a virgin at the time she conceived Jesus and continued until he was born. So, Mary and Joseph were married at some point after the conception but before the birth. And the Bible tells us, but they did not have sexual relations until after Jesus was born. But let's ask the question, does it matter that Jesus, the Son of God, was conceived without the aid of a human father through the divine action of the Holy Spirit? Does that really matter? Well, as you can imagine, this virgin conception and the birth of Jesus is something that skeptics love to make fun of, right? The virgin conception and birth is part of the Jesus story that skeptics love to try to kind of shoot holes in because it obviously sounds pretty outlandish to everyone. For example, Bernard Katz, a biophysicist and a Nobel Prize winner, refers to the virgin birth as the immaculate deception. Atheist Richard Dawkins says the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus and Lazarus and all the Old Testament miracles are religious propaganda which is very effective with an audience of unsophisticates and children. That would be us, right? Thomas Jefferson said the day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by the supreme being as his father in the womb of a virgin will be classified with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. So these comments aren't surprising coming from the people that they come from, right? An atheistic Jew, an atheist, and a deist in Jefferson. But you know, there are also some believers who struggle with the virgin conception and birth of Jesus. And, and they wish that maybe that wasn't really part of the story. There are Christians who believe the virgin birth is something that we can dispense of without it affecting the overall message of the gospel. For example, Rob Bell, who's that controversial author of the book Love Wins former pastor of one of the largest growing churches in the U.S. and was named by Time Magazine one of the hundred most influential people in the world. 
he wrote this. What if tomorrow someone digs up definitive proof that Jesus had a real earthly biological father named Larry? Why not Joseph? But anyhow, named Larry. And archaeologists find Larry's tomb and do DNA samples and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the virgin birth was just a bit of mytholog mythologizing the gospel writers threw in to appeal to the followers of Mithra and Dionysian religious cults that were hugely, hugely popular at the time of Jesus, whose gods had virgin births. Would you still be a Christian? Is the way of Jesus still the best possible way to live? In other words, could we still have Christianity without the virgin birth? People who believe that say that the manner of his birth contributes nothing at all to salvation or the proclamation of the gospel. And people who hold this idea that it doesn't matter point out a number of other facts. That we have four gospels, and only two of those gospels mention a virgin birth. That would be Matthew and Luke. The Apostle Paul, in all his 13 letters of the New Testament, never makes a direct reference to the virgin birth. The letters of Peter and John and James and Hebrews, the other letters of the New Testament, they don't mention the virgin birth. And when the gospel is preached in the, in the book of Acts, in none of those presentations of the gospel is the virgin birth ever brought up. So back to our original question. Does the virgin birth really matter? Is the virgin birth important to our faith, or can we just ignore it? Especially since the idea is so unappealing to many skeptics. I want to suggest that the virgin birth does matter. It does matter. And it matters a great deal, and that we should not easily give it up, um, even though non-believers find it hard to accept. So let's talk about what the Bible says about the virgin birth. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, only two of the four Gospels mention it. In the Gospel of Luke, we have this message from the angel Gabriel to Mary about the virgin birth. And then in the, the, the Gospel of Matthew, we have the message that comes from an angel through a dream to Joseph. Let's look at those passages, starting with the one given to Mary in Luke. In the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. And the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. Now listen. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will name him Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary then asked the angel. How can this be? since I have not had sexual relations with a man. And the angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who is called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. See, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you've said. And then the angel left her. Matthew chapter 1, the message to Joseph. The birth of Jesus Christ came about in this way. After his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. 
But after he considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until after she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. So those passages, as clear as a bell, tell us that Mary was a virgin when she conceived of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's spend the rest of our time discussing why that matters. All right, first of all, it matters for our confidence in Scripture. So it's true, two of the four Gospels don't mention the virgin birth. Mark starts at a different place, and John starts at a different place, right? So two don't have it, but guess what? Two have it, and that's important. Much of the Gospel is verifiable history, right? We should be cautious about saying that something isn't true that's found there. Only one gospel tells us anything about the childhood of Jesus. Should we question that Jesus had a childhood? Only one of them mentions it. Of course not. Paul said all scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, right? 2 Timothy 3.16. That means we better be careful about disregarding parts of it that we might find hard to grasp. Parts that don't appeal to us. If we did that, there might not be a lot of the Bible left over, right? If we can't believe the part referring to the virgin birth, then how can we believe any of the other parts? How can we trust in any of those other parts, right? How can we trust that we are saved by grace through faith? That's what the Bible says. Or anything else, right? To reject the virgin birth or any part of scripture leaves us with a piecemeal Bible. And the parts that are left more likely represent our thinking than God's thinking. You know, I mentioned Thomas Jefferson uh, a minute ago in the sermon. And I've mentioned in other lessons about the Jefferson Bible, right? That's what it's called. But it's something Jefferson made and published where he literally, literally cut out the parts of the Bible he didn't like. He didn't like anything miraculous. Why is that? Because he was a realist. He automatically rejected anything that was mysterious or supernatural. And so he cut all those things out and he pasted them together literally. Not like the easy cut and paste we can do today, right? And he published it. But guess what? It reflected his thinking. It didn't really reflect God's thinking. So the Bible is either inspired scripture worthy of our trust or it's not. We can't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we think belong there. Secondly, the virgin birth matters for our concept of God. So here's the question. Do we believe that God has infinite power or don't we? If God created the heavens and the earth and created Adam and Eve and everything else, then it's not too hard for God to create a virgin conception, right? So when people doubt or question the virgin birth, they're really doubting and questioning God and the power of God. Doesn't scripture teach us that with God, all things are possible? Isn't that what the Bible says? Didn't we just read that a minute ago? 
In Matthew chapter what is it? 1 and verse 37, we read it again in Matthew 19, 26. All things are possible with God. Do we believe that? Or do we really believe, well, some things are possible with God? Or maybe most things are possible with God, but not all things are possible with God? See how this is a problem with our conception of who God is? Denying or questioning the virgin birth raises a huge problem. If God couldn't cause Mary to conceive and give birth without the help of a human husband, then how can we know that God can do anything? Either God is Almighty God, or He isn't. And if He isn't, then we got much bigger problems than a virgin birth, right? The virgin birth matters because it touches directly on how and what we think about God. But number three, the virgin birth matters for our understanding of Jesus. The virgin birth brings us face to face with this foundational principle of Christianity, which is the incarnation of Christ. So the incarnation is one of those big religious words, right? It just means the enfleshment what the Gospel of John describes as the Word becoming flesh. God in the flesh. And John writes, the Word was with God in the beginning, and through the Word all things were created, right? And the Word was God, He's speaking about Jesus. And then the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we've seen His glory, verse 14. So the the New Testament presents Jesus as this God-man, this combination of the two, God in the flesh. The Apostle Paul explains it like this in Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts, to live in a sensible, righteous, godly way in the present age. Listen. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to cleanse us for himself a people, for his own possession, eager to do good works. But notice all that's packed into that one little phrase there as we wait for the glory of what or who? Our great God and Savior. All right? Jesus is man. He's human. But he is God. He's our Savior. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. And he gave himself to redeem us, to buy us back, to buy our freedom from our own sins, right? Now, in the letter to the Colossians, the Apostle Paul explained For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus. And then in in the second chapter, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Jesus is a human being who is God in the flesh. So we have to ask the question, how did Jesus get that way? If that's who Jesus is, if that's what Jesus is, how did it happen? How did deity become human? How did the word become flesh? How is it that Jesus is fully human and fully divine? And the answer is the virgin birth. It was the union of deity with humanity that produced this unique being, Jesus, the Son of God. Now, some people would argue that the virgin birth is necessary for that to happen. And and I don't know whether that's true or not. Scripture doesn't say it was necessary, but it is the way God chose to do it. It had to happen some way, and maybe there was another way it could have happened. But this is the way Scripture says God did it. And that's according to Matthew, and that's according to Luke, right? Right? So we really can't appreciate the nature of Jesus, who he really is, without understanding the incarnation of God and human and all that comes through the virgin birth. So after questioning it or doubting it, we really have no way of really understanding who Jesus really is. And so the virgin birth matters. 
And then fourth and finally, the virgin birth matters for our sense of wonder. I think it would be a huge mistake for us to turn the virgin birth into some strategy that we try to figure out and conceptualize and explain. It's really unexplainable, right? It's beyond our understanding and our reason and those kinds of things, right? What Scripture emphasizes is the majesty and the wonder of it. And we desperately need wonder, right? We need wonder in our experience, in our world. So the virgin birth reminds us we're talking about someone and something greater than anything earthly and human. It's supernatural. Can you imagine the wonder of Mary <laughs> when that angel appeared to her and she learned that she was going to have this miraculous conception and that this wasn't going to be any normal child it's going to be a special child the savior of the world that's hard to take in right and then can you imagine the wonder of Joseph who was going to go ahead and divorce her quietly cuz he thought she'd been messing around with somebody else, right? He knew he hadn't been with her, and yet she's pregnant. But the angel appeared to him and said, no, 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 no. She hasn't been messing with anybody. This is of God. This is from the Holy Spirit. Basically, the angel said to both of them, don't be afraid. This is a God thing. How wonderful is that? But imagine their wonder, though, when they realized that all of this was a fulfillment of prophecy. That God had put the words into Isaiah the prophet 800 years before it happened that there would be a virgin who would be with child and give birth and you were to call him what? Emmanuel. Not that God's on our side, but that God is with us in our midst in the person of Jesus. And finally, after all these centuries of waiting for this Savior to come, this Messiah, he had finally come. Madeline uh, Lengel, who's uh, the author of fiction and nonfiction, you may recognize her name from uh, Wrinkle in Time and the sequels. She's the writer of those. She passed on in 20. Uh, 2007 at age 88. But, but her works reflected her Christian faith and her interest in science. But she had this interesting statement about the virgin birth. She said, the virgin birth has never been a major stumbling block in my struggle with Christianity. It's far less mind-boggling than the power of all creation stooping so low as to become one of us. <laughs> so I don't have a problem with a virgin having a child through the Holy Spirit. I got a bigger problem with understanding why God would even become a human being. Right? So I believe we need to share in the wonder of the virgin birth. I want to encourage us to marvel at the fact that God did all of this in order to bring a Savior into the world to take care of what we desperately needed taken care of, our own sinfulness. And let's marvel that God was with us in the person of Jesus, and let's marvel that God is still with us in the person of the Holy Spirit, who Scripture says lives inside of us. And let's marvel that this same God who made the universe and still rules the universe, and this same God who sent Jesus into the world the first time is going to send him back the second. How's that for some wonder? So does the virgin birth matter? Well, it matters only if Scripture matters. <laughs> Does the virgin birth matter? Well, it, only, it matters only if God matters. Does the virgin birth matter? Only if Jesus matters. Only if our sense of wonder matters. 
So when you hear someone say, well, I don't think the virgin birth matters that much, ask them, really? Really? <laughs> How can something that wonderful not matter? So I want to encourage us to put our whole trust in God and in the word of God. If we believe in the God described in the Bible, then we must believe that, all, that God has all power and has all wisdom, and has all goodness. And if we believe in the God described in the Bible, we must believe what it is that God tells us in the Bible, that it must be true. We must not doubt it or question it. If we don't trust in God and the word of God fully, then really our faith has very little power, very little assurance. We've got nothing really to stand on. If we don't trust in God and God's word fully, then really we're by default creating our own God and putting our words into his mouth. In the end, if we don't believe in who Jesus really is, then we will die in our sins. That's what Jesus himself said, right? In John chapter 8, when he said, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so let's put our faith in Jesus, right? God in the flesh, born of a virgin, died on a cross, buried in the tomb, raised on the third day, and is coming again. That's the Jesus we believe in, right? Amen?